From the Disney MGM Studios in Florida, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, if we pick the winners. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Theater of the Stars and our annual special program, If We Pick the Winners. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Gene and I don't have a vote on the annual Academy Awards, but like a lot of people, we know how we would vote if we could vote. And that's what this special annual program is all about, who we would mark our ballots for if we pick the Oscars. And by the way, Gene and I have no idea how the other guy is going to vote. We have not revealed our choices to each other. Gene has given me his sealed envelope, which I have right here. He has mine. I may be right, or for that matter, Gene may be wrong. But at least we don't keep you waiting for the most important categories. That's right, Roger. One of the biggest differences between our program and the Academy Awards telecast is that we start right at the top. Our first category covers the nominees for Best Actor. <laughs> the nominees for Best Actor are... Kevin Costner as a Civil War soldier who embraces the American Indian culture and dances with wolves. Robert De Niro is one of the catatonic patients who is awakened in awakenings. He didn't wake a thing, he woke a person. I am a person. Gerard Depardieu is the brilliant swordsman who is shy about declaring his love in Cyrano de Bergerac. Richard Harris as the iron-fisted despot of an Irish village in the field. The English are gone, Bull. Gone! Because I drove them out. Me and my kind. Okay. And Jeremy Irons as Klaus von Bülow, accused of attempting to kill his rich wife in reversal of fortune. I'm not afraid of them. Let the chips fall where they may. That's what an innocent man would say. I know. Now let's see who our first winner is by opening Roger's envelope containing his choice as Best Actor. And this is who you'd vote for if you had a ballot. It certainly is. And Roger's pick for Best Actor is Jeremy Irons in Reversal of Fortune. That's right, Gene. My choice is Jeremy Irons in the year's most intriguing performance. Madame, Mrs. Von Bülow. Leave her alone. She's sleeping. I love the way he walked a thin line in Reversal of Fortune, creating a character who toyed with the audience. He could have played Klaus von Bülow as a villain, or he could have played him for laughs, but instead, he created a complex, strange, eccentric man who took a certain cynical pleasure in his own notoriety. Hi, I'm Sarah. Well, a very lovely Sarah you are. Does that really work? Flattery? Absolutely. I look at Jeremy Irons here in this scene from fairly early in the film where he's having a preliminary meeting with Alan Dershowitz, his lawyer, played there by Ron Silver. And what he's doing here is creating a kind of image for Silver with his body language, his voice, the way he smokes a cigarette, the way he occupies the space, the way he's at rest in that chair. He's the leisured European gentleman here with just a little bit edge to that idea as if he's, in a sense, on stage, playing the role of himself. But the prosecution's allegation that I knew about syringes injections, totally accurate. Sonny and I used to give ourselves B12 injections in the late 60s. It was quite a fad in London. And that's a real good performance. Reversal of Fortune was dealing with real events and real people and a real tragedy, and yet it was also about a celebrated scandal that people have been reading about for 10 years in their newspapers. Now, at this point, what could the movie show us that was new? The answer was it could show us this tense relationship between two men who seemed to delight in matching wits with one another, even over a matter of life and death. It seemed impossible that Jeremy Irons could find the right note for Klaus von Bülow, 
but he did. I think he did an excellent job. Why don't you open up my envelope? Is that all you have to say? That's about it. <laughs> this will say a lot. That probably means, and I, let's see, that you are picking for best actor this year from Reversal of Fortune, Jeremy Irons. You see, you see those, those, uh, those IQ injections you've been taking? They're working. You work, They're working. you work with this guy. You teach him, you try to bring him along, and eventually he gets it right. That's right. My choice is Jeremy Irons because I think one of the toughest things to do is to play a real-life character in a movie, especially one so widely exposed in the media as Klaus von Bülow. But as soon as Jeremy Irons came on screen, I forgot what the real von Bülow looked like. Here is the real Klaus von Bülow during the days of his trial for attempted murder. And here is Jeremy Irons proclaiming to his lawyer that he doesn't know the truth about how his wife came to be in a coma. That's really all, all I can... That's really all I can say. Yeah, but is it the truth? Of course. But not the whole truth. I don't know the whole truth. I don't know what happened to her. I wish I could believe you. You know, it's very hard to trust someone you don't understand. You're a very strange man. You have no idea. <laughs> and such an original creation. We always feel like we're sort of eavesdropping on that character. Such a secretive guy. And I really enjoyed that sense of mystery. The real Klaus von Bülow may have been an actor, for all we know, at his trial and his every public appearance. And maybe that's why a superb actor like Jeremy Irons could play him so well. You know, there's a 20-year difference between Irons in real life mm -hmm. and von Bülow. And uh, I didn't notice it. I mean, he has wiped out Klaus von Bülow completely from uh, reality. He, Klaus von Bülow you know, is Jeremy I, Irons. I had a chance to talk to Jeremy Irons when this movie premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, and I asked him if he had studied Klaus von Bülow. And oddly enough, he said no, that what he had done was try to find within himself what he thought had happened in this murder trial, and he didn't know. He didn't know if the man was innocent or if the man was guilty, and so he played him in that playful way where he's toying with the audience, he's toying with his lawyer, and he's toying, in a way, with his own faith. And what's good about that is, obviously, as we're watching this picture, we're studying this guy because we, we're thinking guilty, innocent, yeah, guilty, yeah. innocent. And, and you can't read it clearly. You, you certainly can't read it from the performance. No, no, so it's a terrific no. achievement. It certainly is. Now let's move right along to the next category, the nominees for Best Supporting Actress. And the nominees are Annette Bening, who played a con woman both sexy and merciless in The Grifters. Oh, John, I'm so damned innocent. You and your own mother? You got you. Lorraine Bracco, the wife of an up-and-coming mafia gangster in Goodfellas. Who the hell do you think you are? Frankie Valley or some oh. kind of big shot? Whoopi Goldberg is a psychic who starts getting signals from a woman's dead husband in Ghost. Would you stop rambling? I don't think I'm rambling. I'm just answering a question. He's got an attitude now. Diane Ladd, the calculating and vicious mother of the sweet young thing and wild at heart. And I mean are not gonna see him ever. End of story. And Mary McDonald is a white woman raised by Indian who falls in love with a soldier and dances with war. No, you cannot. Yes. You must be careful. Okay, those are the nominees, and I have right here a sealed envelope bearing Gene's choice in this category, and he would vote for Lorraine Bracco and Goodfellas. Okay. <laughs> you know, the popular choice here was Whoopi Goldberg as we yeah. were playing those clips. But my choice is Lorraine Bracco for Goodfellas, and I'm picking her because her role, I think, was the richest of the five nominated, and she was equal to its every twist and turn. She gave him $20 each. Sure. In the story, she plays an innocent but independent Jewish girl drawn into the world of Italian-American criminals by a young mobster on the rise. What do you do? What? What do you do? I'm a construction person. They don't feel like you're in construction. She enjoys the material gain, barely tolerates the extramarital affairs he has, but she's no match for the drug culture that finally tears apart their lives. Oh, God, I see it. What? I see it. Look, look, it's right there. Damn. Yep, that's it. There it is, Come on, Henry. we got to get, get to your mother's. See? I told you. It's funny, okay? It's funny. It's not the end of the Just, world. We're going to your mother's. Now, this role is the only significant female role in Goodfellas, but that's only part of the reason it stands out so much. 
Lorraine Bracco's character is totally credible as she grows and changes over 20 years in this picture. It's a supporting performance, I think, only in the amount of screen time she's been given, not in the full way that it has been performed. I think she does a great job. Why don't you just open the envelope and we'll see if I agree with you or not. This is going to be an interesting night. Uh, <laughs> Roger's pick for Best Supporting Actress, Lorraine Bracco in Goodfellas. My choice is Lorraine Bracco for Goodfellas, where she made more of a contribution than most people, I think, realized, although Gene realized it, give him credit, because this movie wasn't simply the story of an ambitious young gangster. It was the story of a marriage, of what life is like when your husband commits crimes to support the family. Friday, it was this Friday, and you agreed, so you're a liar! Bronco plays a character who comes from completely outside the mafia. A Jewish woman who at first is confused and discouraged by the way the mafia seems to absorb all aspects of her family life. So finally, one day, she comes around. She admits she's proud that her husband goes out and steals for a living instead of just sitting around the house like other husbands. But after she discovers that adultery is also part of the game, she gets furious. Still, she can't kill him. She can't even leave him. Look at the energy, the life, and the tension in this performance. Crazy enough to kill them, do you? Karen, take it easy. Okay? Do you love her? Do you? Lorraine Bracco's work in Goodfellas was a true supporting performance in the sense that she was supporting and reflecting the whole change in mood that the movie was about as she and her husband gradually got into drugs and began to lose control and the whole merry-go-round started to whirl faster and faster. It was a great performance. Well, obviously I agree, agree. Why don't we get into the tough question of why neither one of us voted for Whoopi Goldberg, the, the popular public choice here tonight? Well, one of the reasons I wouldn't have voted for her is that I think she was nominated for the wrong movie. She has a movie out called The Long Walk Home where she plays a lead or it could be a supporting performance which has so much more important work and it's so much of a better performance and I didn't think Ghost was that important of a movie. I didn't think she did anything in it that was that new for her. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the three people who applauded. <laughs> Don't you think that was clever of me to set you up for a boo? Yeah, well, I... <laughs> now, wait, you notice I've escaped all... At least I, I praised Whoopi Goldberg for other work this year. Why didn't you vote for him? Good point. Uh, uh, the reason that uh, I didn't is that it was just thing you said at the end when you said I didn't think she did anything new. Yeah. I thought that that I thought that the achievement was one of casting her, mm -hmm. that she was perfect for that role, wisecracking and all that. I didn't think that it was a stretch in any way or anything special. Okay, the biggest category for female performers is up next. We'll have our choices for the best actress of the year as we continue to pick the winners. <laughs> Cisco and Ebert special called If We Pick the Winners, our chance every year to cast our own ballots for the Academy Awards. Ballots that are almost without fail, intelligent and thoughtful compared well, to some of the awards they give out. You know, actually, uh, I think they are intelligent because unlike most of the 5,000 Academy voters, we've actually seen the movies. That is an advantage in many cases, you're right, yes. Now, these are not our predictions. We don't know who's going to win, or maybe we do, but at least we're not going to tell you. These are our preferences. <laughs> I picked the choice, uh, my choice of the year's best work, and Gene has also marked his ballot, and the next category is best actress of the year. You dirty bird. How could you? The nominees are Kathy Bates, who played an admitted fan who had her favorite novelist in her grasp in Misery. I don't want her fat! I want her! Angelica Houston, the con woman who would con anyone, and the grifters. The person who don't look out for himself is too dumb to look out for anybody else. He's a liability. Julia Roberts is a Hollywood hooker who turned her life around in Pretty Woman. But never in all the time that I had this dream did the night say to me, come on, baby, I'll put you up in a great condo. Meryl Streep is a wild and crazy, self-destructive actress in Postcards from the Edge. You, when you were a child, want to know? I want to know. Tell okay, me. Okay, fine. From the time I was nine years old, you gave me sleeping pills. And Joanne Woodward as a repressed Kansas City housewife living in an emotional desert in Mr. and Mrs. Briggs.
Do you love me? Or do you? If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. Well, couldn't you tell me once in a while? And those are the nominees for Best Actress. Gene's choice, if he could vote in this category, would be for Angelica Houston in The Grifters. Absolutely. My choice is Angelica Houston, and a very tough pick for me over Kathy Bates. I think that where Bates had two speeds in her performance, the fan and the fanatic, and that she does a great job with both of them, Angelica Houston in The Grifters has lots of rhythms and is equal to them all. Darling. Good. You're going to be all right. She plays the young, estranged mother of John Cusack. They're both con artists, but she's the older pro who doesn't think he has the right stuff for the trade. There's a lot going on in her every scene. There is sexual tension between them. She gave birth to him when she was only 14, and when he was growing up, she claimed to be his sister. She's also a strong-willed survivor, willing to take him for every penny he has. She's always sitting there trying to psych him out, dominate him, and maybe even love him a little. Get off the grift, Roy. Why? You haven't got the stomach for it. Here's an example of the strength of uh, Angelica Houston's character in this picture. Like you. you notice she's smoking you sure throughout you? while eating at the same time, and that left hand of hers is barely going to move, <laughs> except when she wants to take what a drag. Now, here's a boorish guy who's come over to try and hassle her I in a restaurant. Coffee. She looks right around yeah. him. She doesn't even look I mean, at we him. Could have coffee together. And she stands for a lot of women who basically uh, can't stand men. Uh, they have never had a good relationship with one, and they are quite independent and quite strong, and she will put this guy away when he tries to put the make on her. Let's sit here. This is uh, one strange, <laughs> powerful lady she is playing, one of many Angelica Houston has portrayed in what is turning out to be a most impressive movie career. And by the way, I don't think she's going to win the Oscar because her character isn't the least bit likable, but that doesn't enter into our choices. We're voting for the work, not whether or not we like the performance. You know, sometimes, Gene, it seems to me as if the voters vote for somebody they'd like to spend the evening yes. with rather than somebody they'd like to see in a movie. Absolutely. I think it's a very good point. In fact, why don't you just see what it says in that envelope? <laughs> well, three for three. We're the guys who were supposedly famous for yeah. disagreeing. Yeah, right. Rogers picked best actress, Angelica Houston in The Grifters. You're so smart. My choice is Angelica Houston, and I chose her for one simple reason. She was able to create one of the best and most fascinating villainesses in recent movies. And when we think back, I think, over the movies that we love most, it's often because of evil people like this. I'm Roy's friend. Yes. I imagine you're lots of people's friend. Angelica Houston doesn't go over the top here. She doesn't go for laughs. She doesn't cop out by camping up the performance. She simply plays a woman who's been very badly harmed by life and wants her revenge, really even if it means taking it against her own son. You're getting out? You're on the level? You don't need the money. So why the hell can't I take it? Angelica Houston has really just come into her own in the last few years in movies like Pritzy's Honor and now The Grifters. She made her first film when she was a teenager, but she didn't really flower until she was in her 30s. And I think that's because there isn't a drop of little girl or ingenue anywhere in her. She's best playing grown-up women, adults who are too wise and too experienced to play games. And she's absolutely convincing in The Grifters. She is now at the prime of her career. Absolutely. Uh, she's at the first rank of actresses. I think when they start casting now, uh, I suppose they start with Meryl Streep, but I think her name comes up real quick. Yeah. Uh, she also takes some really big risks in this film. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the concluding scenes, she is involved with her son, uh, John Cusack, and she's sitting over him. Something terrible has happened, and she starts making sounds like, like little animal sounds, like yeah. a ferret yeah. or something like that. Now, that can uh -huh. fall apart. I mean, that's a big risk. It's the end of the picture. Yeah. Uh, she's risking a lot. She does it. It works. She, at the end of the movie, she has uh, connected to that scene, not exactly the moment you're talking about. She has a scene a lot of actresses would just flat say, take it out. I'm not going to do this scene. Call my agent or I walk. And she does it. And it's a key to the entire movie because until you realize the tensions between these two people paying off after a lifetime, you don't really understand the film. She has the guts to go for a scene like that instead of being afraid 
and trying to protect her image. You don't play parts like this if you want to be liked. And she has a lot of guts to take it on, and I think she does a great job. Now, let's see what the audience here think. Uh, it seemed to be that there was a lot of support for Kathy Bates. Let's take a question here if we can find one. I do believe that uh, Kathy Bates did have a chilling performance, as well as uh, being able to get the whole fan support and how we were able to like her and then dislike her. I think she took the movie away from uh, uh, James Caan, so to speak. But I said in not picking uh, Kathy Bates, I said there were really two speeds. She's sweet and then demonic. So it was really like, boom, I either do this or I either do that. It wasn't a, it wasn't a film with a lot of arc to it. And uh, it's not her fault. I'm just saying that the other uh, person, Angelica Houston, did more with a tougher role. I'd like to know why you thought Julia Roberts got nominated in the first place. I liked her before. I mean, I liked the movie a lot, but best actress? That question comes up over and over, why was Julia Roberts nominated? And I wasn't surprised at all, and I wasn't disappointed, because she sells the role. She makes us care about that woman. There are enormous gaps of logic in that story. The ending doesn't work too well. There are a lot of questions you could raise, but you don't raise them as long as she's on the screen, because you care about her. And that is something important that an actress can do, and she did it very well, so let's nominate her. That's my opinion. Okay, coming up next, our choices for best original song and soon to come, the best picture of the year. <laughs> Continuing our special program called If We Pick the Winners, our next category is for best original song. The nominees are Blaze of Glory from Young Guns 2. I'm checking out from Postcards from the Edge. And you can just tell him that I'm checking out of his heartbreak hotel. Promise me you'll remember from The Godfather Part 3. Promise me you'll remember. This love together today. Somewhere in my memory from Home Alone. <laughs> and sooner or later from Dick Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> And that was Madonna, of course. A lot of people didn't know that. Right. <laughs> Gene's pick for best original song. How, would, how many people here would have predicted this? I'm checking out from Postcards from the Edge. Yeah, well, the, the big news from, for me is that it was tough to make a choice in this category for the first time in a long time. The music branch has been awful for years, but uh -huh. I thought that four of the five songs were quite good, everyone except John Bon Jovi's from Young Guns 2. <laughs> Hey, I'm 45 years old. I think the guy is too loud. That's all I can say. Hey, Gene, I'm 48 years old. Turn him down. You got it. <laughs> but my pick is I'm checking out as much for its performance by Meryl Streep as for the music and lyrics by Shel Silverstein. <laughs> Meryl Streep is absolutely remarkable. The song plays, I think, a key role in the film, ending it actually as the drug-addicted Streep character declares her intended independence from her drug habit. Okay, now wait a minute, I want to get this straight. You think Meryl Streep singing that song was better than John Bon Jovi. You got it. Than Madonna. Right. Than Harry Connick Jr. Right. Than the John Williams chorus, John Williams, the director of the Boston Pops. Might as well with my envelope. Where do you start with a guy like this? <laughs> We're now at four for four. <laughs> yeah. I, I never would have... I didn't think you had the insight, really, to come up with it. I really, I'm, I'm very impressed. I thought you had been looking at my no, votes. No, I'm right very there. impressed. Okay. Good for you. Okay, well, I'm checking out as kind of a strange choice, I suppose, but I don't really think it's the best of the nominated songs from a musical point of view. It isn't, really, but 
I think it does the best job of illuminating the movie that it's in. Madonna's torch song, she's done that for 10 years. John Bon Jovi's rock anthem, Harry Connick Jr. singing a standard 40s style ballad. Then there's that awful dirge from Home Alone. But if the key word and best original song is original, then Meryl Streep and Shel Silverstein get my vote because that, in context of the film, that song pays off for the character and for the drama of the film. It's not just nice noises on the soundtrack. Uh, let's see uh, if there's any disagreement with us. Oh, I wouldn't think there would be any, right? Couldn't be any, no. no. Why wouldn't you pick Home Alone? Because it fits perfectly with the movie, and it make, really brings out the emotions. It makes you really feel for the young child, Kevin, and how he's feeling at these holidays. Well. The song is nice, but it doesn't really work in the movie, and that's and that's the big. That was the choice I was making was between those two, and I went with the one that really plays a critical role. And also, I mean, I must tell you that Meryl Streep performance of that song completely surprised me. I didn't think she could do it, and I guess there isn't much that she can't do. Okay, when we come back, Roger and I will make our choices in the best supporting actor category. <laughs> Welcome back. It's our night to pick the winners to tell you who we think should take home this year's Academy Award. So they're not predictions, just who would win if the Academy only had two members, Roger and me. Now let's look at the category of Best Supporting Actor, where three nominees play mobsters. You let go of everything. The nominees are Bruce Davison, who has to say goodbye to friends and a lover dying of AIDS in Longtime Companion. It's all okay now. <laughs> Let go. Andy Garcia as the hothead who takes over the Corleone crime family in The Godfather Part 3. Fools you. Fools you mean? These little fools of this guy, don't you think? Right? Right! Graham Greene, the Indian holy man named Picking Bird, who befriends Kevin Costner and dances with wolves. How many? Like the stars. Al Pacino, the oh, comic yeah. tough guy, big boy Capri in Dick Tracy. Okay, boys, do it! You have just said goodbye to oxygen. And Joe Pesci, the scariest of the mobsters in Goodfellas. Anyway, no, it reminds me, I need this knife. I'm gonna take this, okay? Okay, yeah, it's near the Bring it back, though, you know. And here is Roger's preference for Best Supporting Actor. Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. That's right. In fact, I, I don't think there was a better performance in any category all this year, in any acting category, than Joe Pesci's work in Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. No wives, no phone calls, nobody around. Nobody. Well, right he was an actor who's been seen by a lot of people, although I wonder how many of them knew that it was Joe Pesci. He was the brother in Raging Bull. He was the accountant in Lethal Weapon 2. He was one of the burglars in Home Alone. But because he's always in the shadow of the leading men, I wonder if people know how good he really is. What an unforgettable character he played in Goodfellas with his lightning mood swings from laughter to violence. Here's one of the best scenes in the movie as Pesci seems to be clowning around in a bar when his mood suddenly turns violent. You know the money we spend in his... Come on, don't be like that. What do you mean, don't be like that? You think this is funny, huh? He's a... What are you looking at? There's a moment in Pesci's performance I think I'll never forget in this movie, and that's the moment when he suddenly realizes his life is not going to turn out quite the way he thought it would. He's all set up for a quick victory, a triumph within the mob, and he gets a quick and very final defeat. And the way Pat Pesci handles that scene and every other scene in the movie is great acting. I'm very glad that you showed uh, his other work because I think you're right. People don't connect a supporting player sometimes with their work, and he is really one of our finest actors. Let's now, see I made a choice. You made a choice? You chose Joe Pesci and Goodfellas. Five in a row. 
My choice is Joe Pesci for Goodfellas because I've seen a lot of scary criminals in the movies over the years, a lot, like maybe uh, 10 a month uh, for the last 20 years, and a lot of thugs. But this one was an original with a flash paper tempered. What? Everything is beautiful. There's nothing to worry about. I think Pesci's character really embodies the essence of Goodfellas, a guy who thinks he's got it made in the mafia, only to get bumped off and dumped in a ditch somewhere after leading a life of absolutely no value. Why don't you get yourself a nice girl? I get a nice one almost every night, Ma. Yeah, but get yourself a girl so you could settle down. That's what I, I mean. settle down almost every night, but then in the morning I'm free. I love you. <laughs> you know, he has that voice that could be really comical, and yeah, so we uh, laugh a little... But there is an edge to that boy. I mean, this is a guy who doesn't know he's funny. He's a thug. He's an animal. Joe Pesci gave a great performance in a great film. Uh, he, I, I, there isn't a better performance this year out of the whole 20 that were nominated. That's exactly what I said yeah. earlier, as a matter of fact. Right. You've been listening. I was. Uh, you know, That's where I stole it from. Yeah. We had just a brief clip from Raging Bull there, which was one of the greatest films of recent years, sure. Joe Pesci. In both of those films, he does something so well, you can't hardly believe your eyes. He turns on a dime from laughing, jovial, laughter, friendship, companionship, camaraderie to an outburst of violence that the other people in the scene seem totally shocked by. And that nature of his character is, I think, really important to this film. When we come back, Gene and I will cast our votes for the most important category of all, the year's Best Picture. We're here tonight to pick the winners to tell you which stars and which movies we think deserve Academy Awards. And now it's time for the biggest category of them all. You see, you don't have to wait to the end of the show for this category in our show, Best Picture of the Year. Now, you know better than to make a leap like that. And the nominees are Awakening, directed by Penny Marshall. What I believe, what I know, is these people are alive inside. How do you know that, Doctor? Because they catch tennis balls? I know it. Dances with Wolves, directed by Kevin Costner. <laughs> Ghost, directed by Jerry Zucker. He says he loves you. Sam would never say that. Ditto, tell her ditto. That was ditto. Ditto. The Godfather Part Three, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. I spent my life protecting my son. I spent my life protecting my family. Let's be reasonable, okay? That's your big thing, isn't it, Michael? Reason, backed up by murder. And Goodfellas, Martin Scorsese, director. <laughs> I was going to be busy all day. I had to drop off some guns at Jimmy's to match some silencers he had gotten. I had to pick up my brother at the hospital and drive him back to the house for dinner that night. And then I had to pick up some new Pittsburgh stuff for Lois to fly down to some customers I had near Atlanta. And the film that Roger thinks is the best of the bunch is... Goodfellas. There was no doubt in my mind at all about this category. The five nominees this year, one of the films, Ghost, I think doesn't really belong in the same company with the others. Three of the nominees are very good films, but Goodfellas is in a class all by itself. It's like the difference between light and lightning. Take it off. Take it off. Didn't I tell you not to get anything big? Didn't I tell you not to attract attention? Huh? Martin Scorsese's story of growing up in the mafia or everyday life and organized crime is told with such energy, such intimacy, such a sure feel for the complexities of these criminal personalities that in every scene you have the feeling he knows just what buttons to push to make these guys reveal themselves. Watch this suit. Okay, so there you have Joe Pesci and Frank Vincent, the big guy and the little guy. And look at the way Scorsese builds the tension in this bar scene, builds it to violence. These two guys pretend to be friends, but look, the camera moves in a little bit on Vincent. It holds its distance here. It keeps moving in on Vincent. It shows that emotion is growing, that very slight but very characteristic Scorsese moving camera. We begin to have just a little bit of movement now on behalf of Pesci. 
Scorsese is showing how these two guys are both getting heated up a little bit. Now, the bad guy on the left here, the protagonist of the scene on the right, uh, the way that the camera disguises the actual physical distance between them is a characteristic of the way he shows that they're getting to be more and more intent on each other, more and more wrapped up in this conversation they have until finally a moment of explosion. Now go home and get your shine box. Come on, you, come on, you, let him go. Yeah, 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 come on, come on, Whenever I praise a movie like Goodfellas, I always get a certain amount of backlash from people who don't like depressing movies, don't like violent movies, don't like movies about unsavory people. And all I can say is for me, no matter what the movie is about, if it's a bad movie, it's depressing, and if it's a good movie, it's exhilarating. And at every moment while I was watching Goodfellas, I was aware of a great director at the top of his form. Martin Scorsese is as much at home in film as birds in the air and fish in the sea, and Goodfellas is clearly the best film of the year. Well, you're not going to get any disagreement from me, but you know that already because yeah. I picked it as the best film of the year, so... Your choice for best picture is Goodfellas. Absolutely. I also thought uh, it was the best film of the year, and there's no reason to change my vote now. <laughs> what I like in the film is the way director Scorsese changes his direction and editing to fit the changing years and moods of the story. Here's a scene from early on. The mood is lush and colorful and warm. Here's a frantic scene from the late 70s when the film's young mobster is involved in a drug deal and thinks the cops are tailing him. Go inside and tell your mother not to touch anything outside the house. Nothing, right? You couldn't have gone to your mother's house. You have to come here. Everything, everything gonna be all right this morning. Go shopping. This film has a lot of heart, some moral courage, I think, in depicting mobsters for what they are, and direction and editing here are risky and brave. In addition, director Scorsese, you must credit Nick Pileggi, who wrote the original book and co-authored the film script as well. We don't talk often enough about writers, certainly not on this show. And I read uh, his book, uh, Wise Guy, the film that this is, uh, mm -hmm. book this is based on. Yeah. And there are some of the very details that Scorsese used, the peaky rings, the car being mm -hmm. elevated when the mobster to get out of the car right from the opening of the scene. Mm -hmm. It's all in the book. So Pileggi gets some credit, too. But also, of course, from Scorsese's own life, growing up in Little Italy, he has written and talked about the fact that as a kid with asthma, he didn't get out on the street. He watched these people. He watched what they did. And the movie begins with this hero looking at the local mafia guys and wanting to be one of them. So there's an autobiographical component here, too. Coming up next, you won't see this category on the Oscar show. Roger and I each pick what we think is the worst nomination made this year. The name of the seg of this special is if we pick the winners, but now in this segment, we're going to pick the losers instead. That's right. This is the category you won't find on the official broadcast, the year's worst nominations and i've got the envelope right here with gene's nomination for the worst of the year's oscar finalist and the worst achievement is for best achievement in makeup for cyrano de bergerac exactly right this is your that's okay. right you don't you didn't like that part who's nose you got it i didn't think the achievement was that great my selection <laughs> is the makeup in cyrano de bergerac because of all that michelle burke and jean-pierre aish did is find a nice fitting big nose for an actor who already has one. Take a look. The chore here is easily known. Make a nose. If it doesn't look right, keep trying until it does look right. Now, reportedly, the makeup artist on this one got it right on the sixth try. But it doesn't look any better than Steve Martin's big Cyrano nose in Roxanne. It's not that hard a job. By comparison, you know, who knew what an Edward, Edward Scissorhands was supposed to look like? That was a real achievement, and it was nominated. Well, I'm tempted to disagree with you, Gene, just so that we could have a disagreement on this show. I'm tempted to agree with you because there's something in what you... I've got him in suspense now. Well, I disagree or not. I think you're wrong. 
I think that the nose in Roxanne was a worse nose, and this is a better one. And you're, I, I know you, I've known you for 22 years, you're lying right through your teeth, right here. You don't disagree with it me. It was, no, I think it was wrong, Gene. No. I, no. You think the worst nomination, best picture of the year, goes. That's right. You think that's the worst nomination? I think that is the worst nomination of the year. I don't think, I don't think Ghost belongs on the list of the year's best films, certainly not with films like The Grifters and Reversal of Fortune and Avalon left out. What I don't understand is, why did he come back? I don't know. What bothered me the most about Ghost was that it had such a lack of really soaring imagination. I mean, here we have a character who's died and he's gone to the afterlife, he's trapped somewhere between earth and heaven, he lives in the realm of the spirit, and he's sending back messages about the t-shirt he spilled a margarita on and about some kind of a plot that he wants to have solved. If you could talk to somebody in this condition, wouldn't the only thing you'd want to know be what's it like over there, what's it feel like, what can I look forward to? Here's a guy who takes a personal interest in all these mundane things back on earth when he should be looking forward to talking with Aristotle or Shakespeare or Elvis. I'm leaving. Now I know Ghost was one of the year's top hits, but usually the Academy has too much imagination to confuse box office performance with artistic quality. This movie has no business being nominated as one of the year's best films. I think it's the worst nomination of the year. It's worse than The Nose in Cyrano. It really is. Well, let me tell you, we've seen other noses like Cyrano's, but we haven't seen other pictures like Ghosts. I think there is something to uh, its quality. I'd probably put it in the top 25 or 30 pictures of the year, certainly not in the top five. What did you guys think was the worst nomination this year? <laughs> I think the worst nomination this year just happened to be the song from Postcards from the Edge. For one thing, it had no place in, in any part in the movie. I can't understand that, and I really can't understand why both of you chose that for best song this year. I disagree with you guys about Ghost. I mean, movies are supposed to be escapist entertainment, but Ghost had a deep romantic uh, strength. I think that Ghost is the worst nomination because it is a nice film, and it's imaginative, but I think it's too imaginative. I think it's something that just can't happen and won't happen and is too silly. <laughs> Let me tell you right now, that young man has the attitude at his age to become a critic when he's an adult. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, we'll be back in a moment to talk about what we would really like to see most on the night of the Academy Awards. Before we leave tonight, there is really one question that I have to ask you, Roger. Again, this doesn't come up on the actual Academy Award show. Of all the nominees, as they're opening the envelopes, what's the one name or name a picture of a person that you'd like to see happen? You're going to sit there and go, yeah, I'm really proud. The one that would make me the happiest. You got it. This year, it's a tie, Gene, and I, I suppose that's cheating. I would be very happy if Joe Pesci won for Best Supporting Actor for yes. Goodfellas. Yes. Yeah. But... In the same category, I would also be very happy if Bruce Davis had won for Longtime Companion, because that performance was so emotionally moving. I've already said that I think Pe Pesci des deserves to win in that category, but still, I would be just as thrilled personally by either one of those. Yeah, names. whichever way it goes in that you? category. The one I think that I'm going to be rooting for is Martin Scorsese to win Best Director. Mm -hmm. That was the best film. I think he's uh, unquestionably the finest American director. It will be a celebration for style and a tough picture. Uh, it will be a celebration of a real artist, midstream in his career. I hope that's the one I'll if say, Scor yeah. If Scorsese gets uh, the Oscar, you're going to hear a big shout from me. And that's it from Walt Disney World and our special show called If We Pick the Winners. Now it's up to the 5,000 members of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences who will pick the real winners on March the 25th. And until then, the envelopes are sealed. Good night. <laughs> Accommodations for cast and crew provided by the Walt Disney World Dolphin, which is located in the heart of the Epcot Resort area. The Dolphin is conveniently connected by waterway or walkway to Epcot Center and the Disney MGM Studios theme park. Air transportation for talent and crew provided by Delta Airlines, the official airline of Walt Disney World. <laughs>